Thank you so much for the lovely introduction. Uh, hi, my name is Alana Alice, and I'm a condensed data physicist. So I work in an amazing field, but it has a terrible name. And the reason it's terrible is because it has no name recognition whatsoever. This is especially true with members of the general public, but even in audiences of other scientists. When I say condensed matter physics, you probably don't have a clear visual image that pops into your head. This is to contrast with fields like astrophysics, where if I say astrophysics, you might immediately visualize these beautiful images that come from the Hubble Deep Space Telescope. Or if I say particle physics, you might immediately think of the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. So this is a shame. Condensed matter physics is by far the largest discipline in all of physics. When it comes to Nobel Prizes, it wins the majority, um, winning frequently in both chemistry and in physics. And it's also the discipline of physics that's most closely related to real-world applications and devices that make our modern life so comfortable. So what is condensed matter physics? So it's not the physics of things that are very small, like individual atoms or particles, nor is it the physics of things that are very big, like planetary bodies or galaxies, but it's the physics of almost everything that falls in between these limits. It's the physics that you get when you bring together billions and billions of atoms into a real solid a material that you can pick up and hold in your hand. We're in the discipline of physics that's going to tell you why that solid has the problems that it does. So I'd like to begin by giving you some examples of real-world applications that emerge from condensed matter physics. The first is in the area of computation. Condensed matter physicists discovered a property known as giant magneto resistance. And this completely revolutionized hard drive technology, and it enabled our devices to become much smaller and lighter. Another example comes from the sector of energy, where the material that coats solar cells, which is known as photovoltaic, can efficiently convert light from the sun into energy that we can use without harmful emissions. This, too, is a condensed matter system. And then another example comes from transportation, where I'm showing an image of a magnetic levitation train, or a bullet train. <coughs> So the, the, um, the, the material that enables magnetic levitation is known as a superconductor. So this is sort of the broader perspective on condensed matter physics, where the research that we do can lead us. But now I'm going to take it back to the research that I do at Rice, which is far more fundamental. So the question that I'm interested in answering is, can we discover new materials with never before seen properties that will enable technologies that don't currently exist? So this isn't the kind of research that's going to make an existing technology just a little bit better, but rather it's going to uncover a technology that doesn't exist in our world yet. So how do we do this? How do we make new materials? The thing that we're doing is we're combining chemical elements into uh, in combinations that don't already exist in nature and haven't been made already by someone else in the lab. And the way that we do this is actually relatively simple. We take our elements, our metallic elements, we mix them together, and we heat them up above their melting temperature. And then when they're in a liquid, they all mix together. And as we cool it down, crystals can precipitate out of the solution, such as the ones shown here. And if this sounds familiar to you, it's because the physics that I just described is exactly the same as an experiment that you might have done yourself, or you might have done more recently with your kids, which is that you take sugar, you dissolve it in hot water, and when the water evaporates or you cool the water down, sugar crystals can precipitate out the exact same science. So what you might notice about the crystals that I'm showing on this slide, besides the fact that they're all very beautiful, is that they all have very different shapes, or what we call morphologies. So some of them are rather flat or two-dimensional, while other ones are more three-dimensional. Some of those crystals have square or rectangular facets, while others have triangular facets. And what this is telling us is actually something very deep about the atomic structure of that material. So for example, if we consider this crystal here that looks quite hexagonal, if we can zoom all the way in at the atomic level and see how the atoms are arranged, we would find that those atoms have a hexagonal motif in the way they're ordered. So once we've gone and we've made our new material, the question that we want to answer is, does it have any interesting or useful physical properties? And in general, the thing that we're concerned with is, how are the electrons in this material behaving? And the reason that it's the electrons that concern us is because they play two important roles in solid. The first is that they are the thing that carries our electrical currents, and they're responsible for electrical conductivity. And the second is that an electron has an intrinsic magnetic moment. So if our solid has any magnetic property, that too is the, the effect of the electrons. So there are many, many weird things that these electrons can do when you bring together billions and billions of them. But I'm just going to give you two examples that we might help to find. 
One is known as superconductivity, and this is when the electrons can travel through our material without ever giving off any energy in the form of heat. They can travel for infinite time. So if you have a laptop that was built out of a superconductor, it would never get warm no matter how long you used it. Another state that we're interested in is known as a spin liquid. This is a magnetic state, and it's where our magnetic moments behave like a fluid no matter how much we cool it down. We can cool it all the way down to absolute zero temperature and it'll still be fluid-like. And this sort of goes against our common notions of how the laws of thermodynamics should work. So both of the states that I've just told you about, as well as many others, have tremendous potential for real-world applications, which is why it's really important that we're in the lab looking for new materials that can inhabit these states. Thank you very much.